back like we never left. It's Double Move Sports. As always, I'm Steph. I'm here with two anchors in the DMS Discord community. These guys have been talking smack to me for, I mean, going on years now. And the conversation just gotten so good. We thought, why not record this? We got Burrow Lover 9. We do have our own PFT commentator on with us today. This is Isaac from the Discord channel. Y'all know d -Rid. He was commenting on some of our earliest videos. We just ran through rookie rankings. And I would say at this stage in the game, you're open to everything. You're open to every data point. You're open to every prospect because of the range of outcomes that we see every single year in the NFL. You have freaking Puka Nakua wide receiver eight who is on nobody's board, a wide receiver eight in dynasty right now, who is on no one's board. So we're open to everything right now, but we are going to do a mookie, uh, a mookie, a rookie mock Pearl lover. I'm going to give you the one on one here today. I will go one Oh two. D root will go one Oh three, but start us off with a hot take for your first ever podcast appearance on double move sports. I don't know how much of a hot take it is, but you got to go with Caleb Williams. It's the clear cut number 1.1. Interesting. Over Marvin Harrison. You got you got anything to back that up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, nah, he's just the 1.1. <laughs> I guess we should just move on. <laughs> really, guys, we know these, these top four or five guys here are extremely chalk. You don't need to hear me drop takes on Marvin Harrison. I will do it. I have done it in the Discord. Really, the conversation is how early are you taking him in a single QB startup? I've heard some people say 104. Some people on this screen right now say 104. d is that where you still feel Marv should go behind Chase Jefferson and then you had... Marv right there. It might have been like CD or AJ Brown or somebody like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would have him that high. I mean, graded, you look at some of the guys like Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase and their talent and situation, which is why you're taking him that high. But you're getting a 21-year-old superstar. Just take the youth, take the longevity, take the value insulation, and run with it. The guy has no holes on his profile. Am I going to go out and overpay? Like, am I going to trade up? Probably not. But if if I'm sitting in that hole and some startup draft, why wouldn't you? Interesting. And that's spicy. Uh, I, I I get where you're coming from, right? My question would be, if Marv wasn't named Marvin Harrison Jr., would we have Malik Neighbors over him in some dynasty circles? I think the answer would be yes to that. But the name value is there. The hype is there on a guy like this. And so I think you have to chase a little bit of that in terms of the dynasty value. For example, Jackson Smith and Jigba, what has he really done this year? From a overall production perspective, he's done very little. But on the other hand, he has the name value. He's still a high-end wide receiver too in dynasty leagues, most dynasty leagues that you'll see right now anyways, including keep trade cut. So you have to think about that as well. When we bring in these values. That's another reason why, you know, you can be flexible on some guys based on what the market thinks. For 103, d -Rid, who do you have for us here? Are you going to go neighbors, May, I'll tell you Daniels? what, I'm getting, a, I'm getting an absolute steal at the 103 because I'm taking, like, neighbors. Look, Marvin Harrison, like you said, he's a great name. And I know I would take him high for the value installation and what he can bring, but <clears> – <throat> Malik Neighbors is a guy you could really run the offense through. And you see that in the numbers and the college production. They run the offense through him at all three levels of the field. So at Neighbors, you're just you're getting a home run prospect. You're getting a guy that's going to go. He has the outcome of a first, second round startup guy. I have no reservations. Yeah, and not knowing draft capital right now, not having landing spots right now, and knowing that some of the top ten teams – that are going to be picking in this draft are pretty gross landing spots when you think of, be it New England, be it New York Giants. There's a lot of gross, even Washington you could throw in there. There's some gross landing spots, and guys are going to have to do a lot as soon as they get on the field. 
to make those offenses home. And you're seeing that can be tricky in a lot of situations, especially in the case of like a Bryce Young right now. But Burrow lover, Isaac, who you got at the 104? Once you get to the 1.4 and both the best receivers are off the board, you got to go with Drake May. It's debatable there with Roma Dunze, but you got to go with Drake May. Wow. Wow. We are quickly turning into a Roma Dunze show here at DMS. And I have jumped on the train as well, have moved him up recently in the rankings. Rightfully but so. May, May here, we were talking about this a lot in past conversations. Just May has the tools. He has all the tools, plus like the cannon of an arm, plus the poise, plus the power five, plus the efficiency, and he's going to go top five in the draft. So he, he definitely has that guy that has that Justin Herbert type feel to him when you think about his overall resume in college and the draft capital and the size and the tools you could throw maybe a Joe Burrow name in there as well with Drake May with just what he can do under pressure I'm throwing that in there for Isaac what do you think thumbs up thumbs down on a Burrow comp for May I wouldn't agree with the comp but I see what you're saying about how he can operate under pressure such as Burrow he's great out of structure everybody compares says how May is going to be the one who can operate in structure and Caleb's is the one who out who can operate out of structure. But I feel like they both operate well out of structure. Yeah, Dira, didn't you say you saw a lot of film where May was just getting absolutely hammered behind the line of scrimmage? But yeah, someone crazy throws. someone had actually made like a meme video where you know Drake May he'll he'll get the ball out of shotgun and he runs up to the line of scrimmage and they grab him around the ankles and he just makes some crazy throw and it's like. You know, a play like that, you'd see it once, maybe twice if you're lucky. But it was like it, he had had it five, six, seven times. And this video was, I mean, it was funny. But I, it was like I, they lined, I think I saw what you're talking about. It was yeah, they lined week, correct. Yeah, they and they yeah. just lined it up six or seven times, and it's like this is the the North Carolina offense, which is kind of a joke, but it's also a testament to how um, how athletic he is to be able to get the ball out when guys are straddled around your ankles. But uh, pause and uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's 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 a testament to him also being able to still read. You know, a lot of guys that get pressure and their eyes come down, but for him to still have his eyes up and be able to get that ball out five, six, seven, eight times in a season is pretty impressive. It's something you really don't see very often. Yeah, and I'll, honestly, I can't debate really at all with the May pick, even though I do have my pick at the 105 here. Again, this is a super flex rookie mock. I don't even know if we've said that, right? We're four picks in. I didn't even say this is a super flex. I'm just – you would assume Caleb at the 101, as much as we might say that's a blunder, that's a signal to everyone that this is a super flex draft. Yes. <laughs> okay, 105, Jaden Daniels. I mean, this is the chalk top five. We are obviously – it's kind, of, kind of skimming through these picks right now because we don't want to just give you all the same echo chambery takes that you've heard again and again and again repeated on the same top guys. The top guys are the top guys. Whether honestly, like whether all the analytics are there for them or not at this point. Obviously, you guys know I'm going to lean towards the analytics side. D Red's going to go film side, and Burrow Lover is going to be on the film side as well. So you you bring some of that in now. I'm not saying you guys ignore numbers, and you know I look at film. Part of what I liked about Odunze was the film. That's part of the reason why I've moved him up. So, all that to say, Jane Daniels, I don't know if I, because he has the rushing production, I really don't have to paint a picture here that you have not heard before. Number one in the country in yards per attempt as well. So, this is a tools rushing QB. I had Deshaun Watson as a comp in terms of what he can do as a player, what his upside is as a super flex quarterback. And I actually think it's higher. To me, he is not this like he's not going to run a four four or anything like that when we talk about Jim Daniels, but he can get it done on the ground, right? I'm, he's not a Lamar Jackson. Don't it, even mentioning Lamar should be banned when you talk about Jim Daniels. Obviously, I just did it. One hundred six. He needs to learn when he needs to learn when to slide though. He takes a lot of unnecessary hits. Daniels does, you think? Yeah. Yeah, he wants that Heisman. Who's got next? Is it you, Drew? Yeah, it is me, and okay. I'm get I'm getting something in my headphones right now. It's 
<laughs> it's it's the guys from Discord. It's the Germans. They're they're <laughs> wanting Brock Bowers right here. They're wanting Brock Bowers, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to take Roma Dunze at the 106. And here's why <laughs> is because if everybody is a range of outcomes in this in this wide receiver group, you could have some safer guys, you could have some higher hits, but the the possibility that Rome is someone in that Justin Jefferson, uh, Michael Thomas range, it might be small, it might only be five, ten percent, maybe less than that, I don't know. But you at least have that outcome. And his his floor is so high because he's so versatile. He can play all levels of the field as a senior. So he still has that production, even with two day two guys, they may be a day three for McMillan, but so for him to have that production with two uh, NFL caliber guys behind him, I'm interested. And I just, I look at the other guys and there's too much risk or there's not enough upside that, that Rome possesses. Original holes I had in the Rome profile was the late declare. And then I'm not 100% sure that McMillan and Jalen Polk, who he competed against the last two seasons, are are all that great. Now, if Rome is actually elite, these other two guys actually look really solid. If Rome isn't that great, then what does that say about McMillan and Polk? So that's something I'm still working through. But when you look at all of the metrics, Rome is an exciting prospect with obviously the counting stats at the 1500 yards over a hundred targets multiple years in a row with Michael Penix. And that is where some of the volume gets inflated, right? 131 targets this year as a senior, 110 targets as a junior, still impressive. Anytime you put up a hundred targets in college in power five, that is impressive, but you would have loved to see this, right? You would have loved to see a 20% plus like, Ideally, more like a 23 to 25% target share for Rome as a junior. He only had a 19%. So I've heard some things about Rome improving year over year. He certainly improved his contested catch rate. He actually led the country in terms of power five receivers in contested catch rate, 74%. I mean, he turned contested catches into catches almost all the time. Like it's actually pretty incredible what he was able to do this year after a 25% contested catch rate as a junior. So he definitely improved in that regard. And I do think that's one thing that you can like with Roma Dunze is that God forbid, we did not see him regress as a senior. That would have been scary, but to see him come back to school, try to win a championship with Washington and say, look, I think I can put more on tape. I think I can improve, try to help my draft stock. He certainly has done that because I'm seeing him, Mock most of the time and the top 15 picks. Is that what you guys are seeing? Yeah, I would yeah. say top 15. And and it's my opinion and that you know everyone wonders where Rome is in this in this tier. You know, Marvin's obviously one. Is neighbors closer to Marvin or is he closer to Rome? Is Rome like was Rome closer to Troy Franklin or is he closer to neighbors? I think it's it's one with Marvin. You have two A with neighbors and two B with Rome. Wow. And that might be spicy. It might be spicy, but he's a good player. What do we always say? Good Good players 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 are good. good. Yeah. Good players are good. And I think, yeah, Rome's good. I mean, even, even in the worst situation, right? You're looking at Allen Robinson stuck in Chicago. Like that's still at 22 years old. You know, you're getting what was DJ – DJ Moore in, in Carolina, right? He was stuck in Carolina for four years. You could still get a first-round pick. And I wanted to show this, and I'm glad you threw out Allen Robinson as a, as a name there. We actually looked at receivers since 2011 that were the height and weight within a couple inches and within 10 pounds of Roma Dunze. And a lot of the physical comps, again, this is purely physical. Obviously, you have the Cortland Sutton one. That's kind of the chalk name that's compared to Roma Dunze all the time, which to me does not get me excited. I was actually why I was not as high on a Dunze to start in terms of my rookie rankings is because I, that's, that scares me a little bit. Um, I, I like the Drake London comp a bit more, even though that's not a great one-to-one comparison. As we look through this list, Alan Robinson was the name that stood out. And I think that for me was seeing that name and understanding that, Hey, this is the range of outcomes for this type of player. Got me excited because he's not a, 
true burner. He does have a lot of contested catches. He, but he also gets a lot of short game usage and medium game usage. Like this is a guy that's can be used all over the field. He's great downfield. He's not always open downfield, but he catches the ball. So it's like, okay, he's bringing in those deep targets. Everything you want him to do in the short and intermediate game, he's able to do and get separation near the line of scrimmage. There's not really a massive hole in his profile that I would say. Like he doesn't have a drop problem. Everyone thinks he's going to test well. I guess maybe when the combine comes around, there might be some bigger bones to pick with Odunze. But even then, I don't equate testing that much with receivers. It really doesn't correlate to fantasy breakouts all that much. So I'm even then, like if he runs a four five flat, we're not going to ding him. But if he does run, let's say like a four four low four fours, then you're getting really excited about what he's able to do at the next level and the athleticism that he has to burn over the course of his career. Yeah, and you look at some of the names on here, you know, Devontae, Michael Thomas, DeAndre Hopkins. Like, there are some huge upside guys here on this list. Then I would argue some of the other guys that, you know, we took Rome over in the wide receivers. You could do an exercise like this, and you wouldn't have anything close to those names coming up. And also, with Rome... If you look at some of the top tier wide receivers who are getting these 1,800, 2,000 yard seasons, I mean, excluding Tyreek Hill, they are in that 6'2, 200, 215 build, which would be like CD, Cooper Cup, Jefferson, um, you know, Julio is obviously Hopkins is on there. So that is kind of the physical build that you want to chase for an ultra huge fantasy season. Maybe there's more to it than that, but to me it signals an ability to play at all three levels because they do have that medium body type. Love it. Love it. All right, who's got next pick? Who's got 107? Is it me? No, that was me. All right, let's hear it. You got to go with Emeka. Emeka Ibuka. Nice. Nice. I think when you go through that one – 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7. It's all a nice little range to be in. You're getting a nice prospect no matter where you are. Yeah, after this, do you see the, the cutoff after Igbuka? Because then, the, I mean, we're t- we still have Bowers. It's at least safe. At least Dynasty value-wise is safe. After that, then you get into, okay, do you want to go after Penix and maybe J.J. McCarthy if we assume he gets really high draft capital? And we'll, we'll talk about those guys here in a minute. But then at the receiver spot, you have your Troy Franklin. I have Xavier Worthy in that range. You could even – I mean, I've heard some hot takes. I've heard people have Adonai Mitchell, Keon Coleman, Brian Thomas in that range as well. There is, I, th- I think, a clear drop-off after Bowers. Would you all agree? After yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, spoiler alert on the next pick. Uh, Dre, do you want to give us some Egbuka takes? A lot of these Ohio State guys we talked about on the last pod, they are smart. They understand leverage. They understand how to find the holes in the zone. And for me, it comes down to the testing of, is he a man beater too? And, you know, is he like the Jamar that we talked about or is he closer to JSN? Can he be an Amon Ra in a really good situation? So that to me is where the testing is going to come in, but I have no doubt that he's smart, he's savvy. And we're probably getting an injury discount with the high ankle that he suffered. You know, with all it says is, a, is an ankle injury, but for him to have surgery and miss a bunch of time and be zapped, like it almost has to be a high ankle. So you yeah. know, going forward, I don't have any concerns as far as his health goes. He does seem to be dinged up somewhat here and there, like outside of the ankle. It doesn't seem like he's had really a clean season. So that, I mean, that's something I worry about, but uh, you know, you could say that for anybody, but I think he's just a really solid prospect. I mean, I don't think you're going to get that upside of what we talked about with Rome, but you're not going to miss. You're going to have at least a flex play for the next eight to ten years and maybe more in the right situation with someone like Amon Ra. Really what you have to hang your head on is that sophomore year just being so elite that you just say, look, he had 26.5% target share as a sophomore next to Marvin and was used on special teams a ton as a freshman. He clearly has explosiveness. Is it JSN's explosiveness or is it Garrett Wilson explosiveness? That's the level 
where he's at. Those are the questions that we're answering with Igbuka. So obviously, I mean, we're high on Igbuka and he looks to be a very safe prospect. There's so many guys, if you look back, that had injured seasons, especially that last year before they declared. As we were looking through some old stats before we went live today, we were able to see some of those guys that did have those injury seasons or transferred before the portal and had a year missing. So I don't view that as a death sentence. If the NFL likes Igbuka, then we should like Igbuka as fantasy managers because they're the ones doing medicals, literally getting paid millions to do their research on these guys. So I imagine they're going to have a clear picture of medical data and physical therapy evaluations than we're going to have. And that's actually the same thing that we have when it comes to Michael Penix, right? We're skipping over Bowers here. Everyone's heard a million takes on Bowers. He's the chalk. We can talk about the value of Titans of Dynasty. I think that's almost a separate conversation that we need to have for another day. We don't chase tight ends, at least rookie tight ends, in Dynasty Leagues. The only time to do it is if you're a contender. If you need a tight end on a contender, maybe you're a Hawkinson team that just won the championship and you have a pick in these mid-rounds, go with Bowers if he has a good landing spot. Again, conversation for another day. But when it comes to the medicals, like we're talking about with Igbuka, you have the same thing with Michael Penix. Michael Penix has the counting stats. He has the accuracy. He has throws he can make all over the field, short game, long game, tight window throws. And they let him cork it at Washington, which is something amazing that we got to see that we didn't get to see from the J.J. McCarthy's. And even to a degree, Jake Drake May, his junior year, they weren't necessarily letting him cork it a ton in terms of pass volume. But we have seen that with Penix. And I think that just bodes well for his utilization in the league. He, we know that he can sustain a pass-heavy offense because he did it in college in Power 5. Say whatever you want to say about the Pac-12. But I think Penix is really exciting. If he goes top 15, let's say, I think that alleviates a lot of the medical concerns when you're talking about a guy that's blown out both ACLs. I believe he's blown out both shoulders, if not at least one shoulder. Yeah, both shoulders. So, I mean, yeah. he's been banged up, and part of that could be the reason why he's an absolute statue. He does not have much rushing production at all. You are not getting that with Michael Penix. And so if we see him fall out of the top 15 and then he doesn't have the rushing profile, we're looking at a scary range. Like you're praying for a Russell Wilson, Dak Prescott out of nowhere smash at the quarterback position. And that, that is not normal. Your typical guys that fall to day two barely do anything on a football field at the quarterback spot. Like you're praying they're a Will Levis. Like that's a really, really good outcome. What Levis was able to do this year for QB that fell to the second round. If you look back historically. So all that to say, I I believe Penix is the pick here. Let's go and lock that in. I think I've talked enough about him. Anything else to add on Penix boys? Um, Are we taking Penix at 108 or are we taking Bowers at 108? We took Bowers 108, Penix 109. Okay. So now we're at the, the 110. Yeah, the one thing I want to say about about Brock Bowers and this whole thing really okay. quick is um is we need to have an expectation relative to the pick, right? So what is a quote good season for Brock Bowers? Like is it is it seven fifty and four? You know, is that is that what you would consider a good rookie tight end season? Because if it is, and you're taking Brock Bowers at one oh eight, is that is that what you would deem to be a hit? Or are you like, like, wow? I feel like everybody's going to have higher expectations this year. Yeah, every, the, every, what Laporta every, did this year. Yeah, everybody's going to have, have high expectations. But, you know, Laporta literally has the third best rookie tight end season of all time. That's not a reality. So, yeah, but when Brock would, Bowers is getting hyped up as much as he is to be like, like the next right, Kyle so, Pitts, obviously he's not that, but people are hyping up to be that or he could have gone that high right so you know i would let i'd let people take uh brock bowers at 108 if they want but the fact is is that you just you don't the expectation relative to the pick just doesn't match up for me wow you know hey man it might be a hot take but it's like you know what oh, it is with, you know with with the 108 yeah. just <laughs> just go just go trade that for tj hawkinson pre-acl just go trade that for laporta like and just take that injury risk or that uh that bust risk the, uh, of, no, of brock no. yeah of brock bowers just do that instead yeah. of taking brock bowers like there's no point in taking brock bowers at 108 not to I'm shit on, on that but i wouldn't draft him that late into the second i feel like he's more so like 
late first, early second type of player? Yeah. I mean, I won't own any of Brock Bowers, but the other thing with Brock Bowers that I have a problem with is look at Stetson Bennett. He's a small arm quarterback. He does not throw deep. Guess who he throws to? The underneath guys, Brock Bowers. Look at Adonai Mitchell. Went to Georgia. Traded out. Who's their other target? Lad McConkey. Like, there's no other targets in Georgia. So his in, his production's inflated. You have a quarterback who can't throw past 15 yards. Brock Bowers is just in an elite situation, and he's an okay guy. Wow. Are we gonna Are we gonna see that that situation convert over to the NFL? I don't know. But if it doesn't, and he turns out to be like Cole Komet, are you gonna be shocked? I'm not. Maybe that's a hot take, but I, I know I'm not going to own any of Brock Bowers, that's for sure, unless he just ends up in some – maybe he ends up in, like, LAC or something and, and Keenan's out and Mike Williams is off the ACL and Quentin Johnson's horrible. Like, that's probably the only way I'd end up constituting taking him at 108. But – and then and wow. then, then Penix, just, just to double up on the Penix pick, um, you know – Either, either he's going to pass the medical or, or he's not. And as, as a quarterback, you know, you don't, you don't have that middle value like you see with Ty J Spears where it's like, well, he's, he's missing an ACL, but, you know, we'll still draft him at some point. Like either, either he's going to pass and you're going to take him in the top 10 or he's not. And to pick him at 109 – you know, we are assuming that, that he is going to pass the medicals, but if he's not, just strip him off this ranking and, and throw him to the back like we did Sean Tucker and call it a day because most of our dynasty drafts are after the real NFL draft. So it's not like, you know, we're picking today and we have to stick to Michael Penix at the 109. But that's just my little rant on those two picks. So medicals aside, let's say I told you guaranteed, guaranteed Penix goes, let's just say top 10. Yeah. Let's say he goes let's say he goes to Atlanta at nine. If he goes top ten to Atlanta, it's he's debatable there with Emeka. That was exactly where I was gonna go with like yeah. I'd I'd probably put him right behind Jaden Daniels, honestly. Yeah. And if you need a quarterback, I mean you could even talk uh yeah, I mean you're if if he's passing uh his medical is you're talking about him in that Jaden Daniels tier for QB three. Because yeah. the one trait that Michael Penix has is elite deep ball accuracy. And if you look at elite deep ball accuracy, it's one of the highest correlators to success in the NFL. Stroud, Prescott, Burrow, some of these big arm guys, they're just they're not accurate, but they can push the ball over the field. You have to defend the whole field. But because he has that deep ball accuracy, he's going to be a premium if he checks out health-wise. I have heard different comps like Tua – Tonga Viola, Jared Goff for Penix. He he plays a bit bigger. I think people just say the two a thing because he's left-handed and doesn't yeah. rush. What's a good comp for Penix right now in terms of his his value, knowing that he's not a rushing QB. He's very landing spot dependent. I guess is yeah. really where I'm trying to go with with this line of questioning. But we do have some nice landing spots. We have yeah. Las Vegas at 11. We have Minnesota at 12. We have Denver at 14, Seattle at 15. All could be really, really interesting landing spots. I mean, Penix to Seattle stays in that Washington area. Yeah. Everybody without, in Seattle wants him. Without getting too much into hypotheticals, I, I do feel like, you know, the Raiders are Michael Penix and the Raiders just like meant to be. <laughs> they, it just seems like such a Raiders pick, but I, I think he's a lot, he's really similar to Dak post Dak's, uh, ankle injury you know after the ankle injury Dak really doesn't run anymore I think he's afraid to take hits and but he's still a really good deep passer and it's getting him by uh, that's a yeah that's a good comp interesting so this is this is why we jump on and do these shows as we get unique perspectives on guys I'm, I'm still I I'm reeling from that Brock Bowers hate that I just heard because I just I have not heard that before from anyone I mean, would you be, would you be excited if you spent the one hundred eight on seven fifty and four? Is that Kincaid? Well, I'm just saying. Just I mean, that's probably like a that's a quote good rookie tight end season. So, are you happy with that? Well, if I'm taking him, it's for value accrual and 
what you want career long with tight ends. You should never, I mean, almost never, right? We say that, and then we have Laporta in the perfect landing spot. Yeah, that's but like the even thing. even Michael like Mayer he... right now. Michael Mayer did absolutely nothing from a production standpoint. I'm having a hard time like prying it from people's hands for mid seconds right now. Nobody wants to yeah. sell Mayer because they're hyped about the QB turnover that could happen in Las Vegas, and then over time you have like Adams is getting older. Jacoby isn't some like elite elite target magnet. There's there's definitely room for Mayer to get a piece of that pie as well. So people are excited about Mayer. So I think that's what we're talking about with the tight end yeah. value. And and even on the value, it's like, okay, if you had 108 and you were to trade it for a veteran tight end, like what, what tight end could that get you on the market? Yeah, and I just pulled up keep trade cut, and I don't even want to tell you all where they have some of these guys because this is horrible. <sighs> I don't know. Let's circle back on that one. I think we need a okay. whole, a whole formulated, manufactured, thought out take on Brock Bowers to really do this justice. Yeah. Uh, but chasing tight end, even in tight end premium formats, is not the way to win your leagues, especially if you're not an Uber contender. The tight end should be the cherry on top. Just how in the real NFL, it's hey, get your team ready and then put the rookie QB on top so you have this rookie contract stretch to go compete for a Super Bowl. Yeah. That's the equivalent in Dynasty is once you have everything ready to compete, then you go out and buy buy the tight end one. You're, right. you're, comp- because- like you're going all in on contending. Go get Travis Kelsey two years ago and just pay that premium and ride him till the wheels fall off. Right. And and because if, if you think about it in terms of points, some of our Discord compatriots were taking Travis Kelsey at the 103 and redraft, but it's like you want to think in terms of, of absolute points, right? If a, if a tight end one gets you 200 points and a running back gets you 300 points, take the running back in terms of absolute points. But then once you've maxed out your team to where you cannot go up marginally, that's when you drop in the marginal victory of a tight end. So 110, I don't even know who's up. I'm getting so lost in these beautiful takes that we're laying out for everybody. I believe yeah, I'm lost pick. too because you did the 1.8 at 1.9. <laughs> Okay, go go ahead, D. Reed. Go ahead and give us the one ten if you feel so inclined. You know who I'm going here. I'm going to yeah, take. I'm going to take Keon Coleman. Oh, Whoa. here we go. Hot, hot. And here, here we go. Here's why is because right now, I think Keon oh. Coleman is getting discounted because his inability to separate. But if you look at the Florida State offense, it's a run-heavy offense with Trey Benson. Their quarterback's horrible. They scheme up two X's on the outside with him and six seven uh, Johnny Wilson. Johnny Wilson. So you, that just tells you right there that that this is not a normal offense, and with Keon Coleman being that that big X. Um, you know, his, his big knock is he doesn't separate, but he has special teams yards. What did you say, Steph? He, he's like third or fourth in the NCAA in special teams yards. He's like that. punt return yards, I believe. Yeah, so that, that to me tells me that he has the juice to shake guys and, and get open in route concepts. And but you he can tell the team thinks that too because they try to scheme him up. And that, yeah, they do, they do try to scheme him up underneath and get the ball in his hands. But I just wonder if it's an inability out of out of Jordan Daniels to get him the ball, or just at Jordan. Oh, Jordan Traps, excuse me, uh, <laughs> to get him the ball deep, or just an inability, an unwillingness to throw the ball. I just I wonder if there's not some kind of discount him discount here with how Florida State is either using him. Let me talk through. Coleman right now because I think there's some things to like and then once you dig in beyond the surface there's some really glaring red flags there's absolutely red flags there's absolutely red flags to to me at this point in the draft there are still safer names that are have a much higher likelihood of breaking out but Keon, Keon Coleman is an upside swing and I think that's really what you're saying yeah and there are some things to look at so the 22.7 percent target share as a sophomore at Michigan State, next to Jaden Reed, 
that that's not nothing. I mean, that's really impressive. We we know he's an athletic freak. We know he's big, but even to have all of those things and still get almost a 23% target share next to NFL talent in a power five offense is not nothing. Like that's something that we could look at and say, okay, that's, that's exciting. Early breakout for Keon Coleman. We can start to get interested. And then there's some things like I've heard a lot of excuses, right? They're data backed excuses, right? They're contextual excuses. Like you just walked through with the way the Florida state offense is built, but there are a lot of excuses for, why Keon Coleman wasn't this elite, elite, elite guy in terms of target share, in terms of separation, even in terms of contested catches. Like, he has the same amount of contested catches as Marvin Harrison on 30 fewer targets. He is almost always in contested catch situation. That's the main red flag that we're talking about. He, we don't know right now if Keon Coleman can consistently get open up against man coverage, especially at the NFL level, because he can barely do it in the ACC. Now he has amazing hands, right? He's going to bring the ball in, and a lot of people have made that George Pickens comparison with Keon Coleman. And this is actually admittedly where I had George Pickens right here at the 110 just a few years ago in these rookie drafts. So I, I see the tantalizing upside as well. It really just comes down to pick your poison. I mean, he, he is getting the early declare. Coleman is. Assume, I mean, we have him in this draft right now, and he's a junior. So we're assuming early declare in there. Certainly from a declared. size, speed. He's probably going to jump out of the gym. And he does have that special team ability. So he's an explosive guy. Now, is this a Quentin Johnston situation where, like, literally he can't separate? Is this a Nikhil Harry where he can't separate? I don't know enough right now to tell you 100% that, no, he is not those guys. Give me Paint a picture for me one of you two on that upside comp for Keon Coleman when we talk about range of outcomes. DK Metcalf. But okay. there's, there's also, because he is so, there's so much agility and there's so much juice when it comes to the special teams game. And it's like, why is that not translating when you watch the offense? And that's that's what we need to figure out because if he has the agility and that kind of juice, he should be able to route run. And you looked at Quentin Johnston. Quentin Johnston had the yak, and he, he had those flexibility and that movement skills to where it's like maybe he can become a route runner. And that's where, you know, a 6'4 route runner becomes scary, but – We didn't really see it. And maybe you're getting some kind of discount with Keon Coleman because that ability is there, but he needs to either channel it through some new offensive archetype or he just doesn't know how to set people up. I don't know what the answer is, but (laughs) there there is a big swing. Yeah, with with Keon, I feel like you're looking at the separation of George Pickens and the hands of Drake Linden. Yeah, he has amazing hands. He, his hands are absolutely out of this world. Like his, his drop rate, given how many contested catch situation he's in, his drop rate, you should see it closer to 10%. <clears throat> and what you're seeing right now, if I go look at his drops on PFF, 3.8% this year, 4.9% last year. I mean, that's that's incredible, especially in the context of all of these contested looks that he's getting. He is coming down with them. Uh, and I know – because you've, you've mentioned this, Keon Coleman's highlight film is some of the best highlights that you'll ever watch because of all these crazy contested catches that he's making. Yeah. So P- George That's Pickens is, is so kind of the – Yeah, P- Pickens is definitely the exciting comp here. Let's move on. 111. You want to you take this one, Isaac? A.K.A. I PFT mean, commentator, A.K.A. Burrow Lover 9? Hmm. You got a couple different out, and this is honestly, there's some decision points here, right? We're getting completely away from the chalk. I think the chalk yeah. right now is probably Brian Thomas, <clears throat> just from yeah. what I've seen looking across the space. We have ideally you trade down here, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that's an interesting discussion. Once we fill these out, I'd love to actually take a look and see where feel, the tear break is from these guys. For me, it's either Ad Mitchell or Brian Thomas. Okay. I know you, you like Adana. I'm not quite in on Adana quite yet. I just think he's a little too like one dimensional. Looks like almost like a stretch Z. 
the way to, I look to, at his profile. To be fair, I was kind of between Keon Coleman and Brian Thomas. I just took the the massive upside swing with Keon Coleman. Well, let me jump in here then, and I'll go ahead and, and take my boy Xavier Worthy. Y'all know I'm yeah. high on Worthy. <laughs> Y'all know I had to do it, and I don't yeah. care who. I don't care how many people want to laugh and make their little comments on Worthy and make their little drop jokes that I've seen in these YouTube comments. Dudes have no idea what the heck they're talking about. He's just a deep threat, Steph. He's just a deep threat. He's just a deep threat who had a thirty percent target share as a freshman. He's the twenty twenty four Jalen Hyatt and a thirteenth no shot, no <laughs> shot. Xavier Worthy was a target <laughs> magnet the day he stepped on a Power Five field. At Texas, there's nothing else you can tell. He, to me, he looks almost more like a Tyreek Hill when you watch him play with how explosive he is. And I mean that in terms of winning at all levels, short game, he'll juke a guy out of his shoes, get upfield in a hurry. He can play a deep threat role when he needs to be. Is he the biggest contested catch monster? Go up and get a guy? No. But is that a profile that you want to chase in 2024? Is the guys who can't separate that need to get schemed open? Then we're talking about, like, the Gabe Davis type guys. Like, it's either a deep shot or a screen. There is no nuance to a guy like Gabe Davis's game. I want to see separation at all levels. And when you look at the, the comps for a guy like Xavier Worthy, who has literally one of the, the cleanest profiles you'll see in this class, 30% target share suppressed in, over 28% as a sophomore against – you know, in an offense with NFL talent – and then this year, 26.5% as a true junior, already got the early declare. All mocks that I'm seeing are early second round for Worthy. And when I look at his archetype, it's Devonta Smith, it's Jordan Addison. We have freaking Tank Dell as a low-end wide receiver, too, on keep trade cut right now. And you're telling me that it's not improbable a year from now that Xavier Worthy is an absolute steal at the 111 when people want to get super excited for this explosive playmaker that can be used at all levels. And while I do see the role player concerns, right, maybe a team takes Worthy to be a deep threat or sees him as kind of a like gadget player, there's still enough outs in Worthy's game based on what he did in college. He yes, is actually he just that versatile. Down. And then you, you take into the account, he's so explosive. He led the country in punt return yards as a junior. I'm not going to worry about draft capital. Right, everyone was telling me Jonathan Mingo is going to break out this year off of a draft capital. There's, there's so I was much just that we can look at. Like, if you think he gets first or second, because if he gets second, there's possible team landing spots like the Panthers or maybe the Chargers. Yeah, yeah, I think landing spot to me, I, I think it won't matter. Right, either he's in a target funnel by himself and his value is going to skyrocket. Even if you want to tell me he's the next Darnell movie or Hollywood Brown, Darnell Mooney or Hollywood Brown, I, I don't care. They, you get them in a funnel, and they're gonna their value is gonna go up. And then on top of that, he's shown like, he actually profiles more like a high end number two, like a Devonta Smith next to AJ Brown or Jordan Addison next to Justin Jefferson. So it's like either way, whether he's a high end two or he's in a target funnel by himself, he's gonna do things. He just gets open off the line of scrimmage consistently. And then on top of that, he's just super explosive with the ball in his hands. He's smaller. He's probably gonna get hurt. He's not the best contested catch guy. But we have so many slot separators, whether it's Deontay Johnson, Stefan Diggs. These are the type of guys that you want that can be these absolute target magnets in an offense. Garrett Wilson has that to his game. Devonta Smith showed it as a rookie. The drops got cleaned up. I don't know what else you want me to say on Worthy. Yeah, I believe since our last episode, we have confirmed that the drops did come back down after he broke his hand. I mean, we thought it was the broken hand, but we just it's nice to confirm and, and nice to see that those drops and drop a seventeen point six percent average depth of target. He was u- being used a ton when there was no Adnai Mitchell next to him, deep downfield with a broken hand. What that showed me is that he actually has that deep threat ability. And then you watch a lot of the film from this year. It was deep touchdowns downfield. He had the great one against Alabama back in the end zone. That was incredible, That which made up for some pretty bad drops, admittedly, that he had. I'll be objective on that. Some pretty bad drops in that game against Alabama, but plenty of other games that you watch. He, he does a lot all over the field, short game, medium game, deep threat, like he can do it all. And I think that helps as well. Even if you want to tell me he's a role player, well, I like the roles that he has for fantasy. Yeah. Now is, it, think, now is it Brian Thomas at the at the one twelve? 
Yeah, I think to round out the 1.12, I would take Brian Thomas. Because thinking about it, if you have you have an X percent chance of getting a Christian Watson, but with better hands, or you can draft A.D. Mitchell, who has the upside of T. Higgins, but he has shown that he's been injured more often, can't stay on the field, and disappears in some situations. The thing I need to see with Brian Thomas, I, I can get there with you. And it's all contingent on one thing, which is why he's lower in my rankings. I need to see him weigh in a lot heavier than what he's listed right now. What is he the, listed? Something and like don't use five? don't use pro re- football reference. Use PFF. I found that to be, mm-hmm. at least for right now, where we're at, uh, to be the most accurate. I'm pulling it up, but it, it was scary. It was like the only guy from that physical archetype yeah, there's not many with his Would be Kenny Galladay. It, it's Kenny yeah. Galladay or nothing. It, it's yeah. really what you're looking at. A guy that, yeah, I have it here as well, 6'4", 205. That's scary slim. Yeah. That's scary slim. Yeah, with him, you know, it's 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 nice that he can play that deep threat role and, and the plays he makes are going to be big. But you just wonder, you know, can he bring it back down and become more versatile and play in the short and intermediate, or is it just going to be bombs away? It is nice. I do think he has great hands, but you just wonder what kind of volume he's going to get and if that is going to translate to fantasy points. 10.4% target share as a freshman, 11% as a sophomore, 21.3% as a true junior next to Malik Neighbors. He also, throughout his tenure at LSU, was up against guys like Kayshawn Boutte. Uh, Palmer was another guy that was there. What I would say is we need to see Brian Thomas weigh in over 210. I think at that point, then I can forgive, okay, yep, he doesn't fit the size archetypes, but the same case I'm making with Worthy, where, hey, we can throw out some of these, you know, one-to-one size comps if the talent is there. And I would say 21% as a true junior at LSU in the SEC next to elite talent, a guy that, I mean, we literally just took him 103 in this draft. That's really, really impressive. He was 16th in contested catch rate this year, Brian Thomas was, which I think is another thing that you could say, is, is a really positive thing about his, his game, right? If he had a really bad contested catch rate, then it's like, okay, he's big, but then he can't even use his size to his advantage. But we are seeing that at least based on the analytics right now. Yeah, and in those early years at LSU, I mean, you have to think this is after after Burrow and LSU was turned bad, real bad, real quick. Um, you just wonder how much of that dysfunction carried over to him early on and to where they started to figure out a little bit with Jaden Daniels, and that's why you see some of this later production. But you're right, it is nice that you do see the production against some of these other studs like Keishon Butte while he was a stud and um, and Neighbors. So, look, we're almost an hour in. I think we go ahead and stop it here, but we're going to do part two as another episode. If you're still watching, I appreciate y'all rocking with us as we're getting these takes in. As you can tell, we got a mind meld going on. We are, are brainstorming and theory crafting and, and creating these electric fusions of different takes to figure out what is the right answer on these players and these prospects. Y'all know I'm bringing the takes. If you have your own takes, join the Discord channel. Jump into Dynasty Leagues against us. Yes, you can put your money where your mouth is. Join Dynasty Leagues against us. We got plenty of other things going on in that community. Conversations, rookie rankings. We got playoff leagues going on right now as we enter the playoffs and the Super Bowl. Always fun things to do. Anything else, boys, before we jump out of here? Like, comment, and subscribe, please. I uh, I also I want to give a shout-out to my mom. She uh, I told her I was going to join a podcast, and she said, well, you always had a face fit for radio, so... Thanks, Mom.